We have about 30 minutes. We have about 30 minutes for a panel discussion where the majority of this time will be taken up with um, all of you asking questions, at least to kind of prime uh, the pump, and then perhaps as we kind of get going, the panel members could even start kind of discussing things themselves. This is more than just a Q&A to the panel, but a kind of open discussion. So feel free um, uh, to, to answer any question, I presume, that's posed to you. Um, so long as if it's directed to one specific person, they have the first chance to answer it. Do we have any um, questions now? We have some roving mics around here, just to get the, the ball rolling. I'll start. Thank you um, for the opportunity to kick it off. I was struck by how in each of your talks, in a way, um, the issue of suffering was um, if not quite central, at least present, which is, of course, a, an, an issue that in a lot of uh, discussion of transhumanism is trying to, um, Holger's terms, optimize, but it's also, op the optimization is the elimination of suffering, which just does seem endemic to the human condition, or maybe also animality generally, but that's a feature of us, and we're trying to, in, in, not we, but the transhumanist project is really seeming to want to, um, eliminate that. But I wonder whether you might think, in fact, even that it's a, it's a suppressed eschatological notion within the transhumanist movement. Because of course, even the longing to eradicate suffering is a form of suffering or an undergoing that is a kind of psychological <clears throat> pain. And I wonder how each in your own way you might address that question. Because of course, you all touched on it. I'm quite happy to kick off. It's all working, yeah? Yeah. All working. yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I really, that, that quotation I gave from the letter of Barnabas, mm -hmm. mid-second century, about the human being is mm -hmm. earth that suffers, I think just says it absolutely all. However, I think one can make it a much richer notion of suffering um, than we might have if we just use the English word suffering. The the main burden of the weight of the Greek word, anthroposka ye estin paskusa, uh, pas pa pas uh, suffering, is passivity. Yeah, it's, it's being mm -hmm. passive. Passion. Passion, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, and so the image there obviously is, you know, the hands of God molding the clay, and we are being molded throughout the course of our life. And, well, that does happen in, you know, in, in suffering, in, in undergoing all these different things. But it can also undergo, it can also happen in a more positive way. I also use a verse from Psalm 103, 104, which <coughs> I really like because um, the English has got an idiom there which I don't think translates into any other language. Uh, it's not in the Greek, it's not in the Hebrew, and any other modern European language. You take away their breath, they die, return to the dust. Yeah? That idiom in English, you take away their breath, has got a completely other meaning as well. It means to be struck by awe. Yeah? To be awestruck is also, in that sense, an experience of suffering. So it's not just pain and whatever else it might be that um, is part of our suffering, which results in us being human, but it's also that experience of awe, of joy, of, of, of love, all the other things which also help form us in that way. Okay? And then I think the overarching, <coughs> mean, uh, the overarching scope in that is to go from passivity to activity. Yeah? Um, I guess in a modern idiom, one would say, yes, we're bound to suffer. And we, are going, we are going to fall sick. We are going to die. We, we go through all of these different experiences. And what we've got to do is to try and find meaning in it. That idiom of finding meaning in our suffering is, is a fairly modern way of putting it. But what it really is doing is to, if you like, kind of to take the upper hand and to be in control of it so that it actually becomes formative towards a particular end. And I think that's where moving from, in, in the ancient world, they would have expressed it in terms of moving from passivity to activity. We come into the world passive victims without any choice and passive victims of death. We're going to die no doubt about it, period, it's a fact, yet we can actually turn that inside out by voluntarily 
taking up the cross, not living to myself, dying to myself, living for others, and all the other kind of things, which would be a way of um, voluntary suffering, making that suffering active. Does that make sense? It doesn't. May I just follow? Okay, I can watch it. I don't want to do Brent's work for him, but I thought what, um, <laughs> in the Stegner story that you cited, which I have not read, but I've gone to, because he's active, the, the one husband in his activity, in the way he inhabits his responsibility to his wife, he doesn't experience them as chains. His activity is a graced right. way of sort of undergoing life in a humanizing way. I thought that was what I have to read this. Mm. It's fantastic. So because it, of course, casts these deep theological notions in a very quotidian sort of, mm. way, which is wonderful stuff. So. And, and by the way, both those couples are academic couples. Okay, so you also have what's going on with the failed ten years and, and things like that on the side. Um, so it's too depressing then. <laughs> uh, not for one family, <laughs> Sir, or one, one married couple. Um, okay, I want to preface what I'm going to say, that the suffering that results from physical pain, I don't see any inherent value to. Okay. All right. But there's other forms of suffering. And what I've simply been trying to do is to think about, I want to reject two modern notions of what constitutes a good life. One is that it's the end result of a project that I oversee. Okay, so I don't think my life is a project. And I don't want to use the metaphor either that um, um, I can cherry pick my life. Okay, I want to think of the metaphor of life as a package deal. And there's certain conditions that you have to take with it. So that if, if you choose a certain calling or vocation, then it embraces you and it's the package it's the package deal, which means that you're probably going to be, it's going to entail suffering at some point. Um, and that, again, the suffering is not, is not something you seek, but it's something you don't try to avoid either. And it's just, again, in that notion, you know, of, of I think in the story of Stegner, it would have been morally myopic if all he saw was his crippled wife as a failure, but instead saw it as a possibility um, and I think that's just part of the package deal in that case of, of, of married life. Uh, so that's, that's the metaphor I'm trying to think of more and more is, is what does it mean to, to be embraced by a life as a package deal rather than trying to assert greater control over it. And I think it, you're, you're going to suffer in that. I wonder if it's helpful, sorry, I wonder if it's helpful to distinguish further between pain and suffering. Uh, arguably within Augustine there's this distinction that one can have pain without suffering. Thinking of suffering as the moral, spiritual anguish that can happen, but understanding ourselves as evolved creatures, pain is part of the world as we have it. If you have two cells eating one, uh, one, two cell eating one cell creature, you have pain. If you have a tornado, you're gonna have pain. But to distinguish suffering as an improper response, a, a spiritually derelict response to the problem of pain. And then look at some of the uh, transhumanist project as a, moral, a morally problematic response because it's trying to end pain. And our job is not to um, end pain, but to learn how to live well um, in blissfully, if you will, or blessedly, and let's not say blissfully, and live blessedly with the context of pain. Perhaps. <laughs> but I think, I think it has to be, I don't say context dominates all foreign things, but I would want to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. And what I'm saying is, um, sure, there's certain kinds of pain I learned to live with, When I'm in the hospital, I don't particularly want to live with it. And at that point, I think the relief of pain, I don't think I would become a better person for having gone through the pain of, say, post-surgery. Post -surgery. Okay, so I, then that's why I said perhaps. And I think, and I think but I think you're right. What the, what the, as I understand the transhumanist agenda, is that there can never be anything good from any sort of pain or suffering whatsoever. And that's what, I'm, that's what I want. Yeah. Trying to <coughs> pain as, as its own problematic yeah. response, but there's some pain, regardless of the implication of the pain. Yeah. One stands 
and, and the pain after a night of carousing eventually does teach you something. <laughs> I, I think there's a um, sort of fundamental uh, occlusion or distortion so when you focus on pain as, as uh, the only you know, the experience of, like, nobody wants pain, but the whole idea of suffering uh, that John brought up with, uh, with pathos, something that you undergo, goes fundamentally to a sort of philosophical attitude toward reality, I think is what Holger pointed out in this, in his talk. So fundamentally, do you accept a given that you cannot construct, or fundamentally, do you think you can construct everything, and therefore you have this sort of Promethean spirit that's deeply ingrained in us through um, you know, the spirit of mastery of technology uh, that sort of feeds that thing that you, because it's a transhumanist project in the end, you know, there's no evolutionary process that I can actually, that I cannot take into my own hands and I can, I can construct myself and I can construct everything uh, and therefore have total control. Um, and I don't think people think enough about the fact that that is just a tiny, it is true of ourselves that we can do that to nature, and it's worked for a long time, but it's only a little part of who we are and how we perceive, but we've sort of blown that up into how everything should be. And transhumanists, I don't think they see that. For them, it's just normal. Well, that's what science does, right? You leave your suffering, you uh, replace parts, you, uh, cons you know, engineer ourselves into immortality, basically. But what that actually means is that you construct your own humanity. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, you kind of abolish what it means to be human in terms of the, the passiveness that you, you know, your active passivity, if you will, that you need to take what's given and live within that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the, there is a problem talking about suffering that is basically the problem of um, talking about something that's almost beyond words or beyond language. Um, it's very easy to theorize about suffering and to de develop some nice theology or philosophy of suffering, and then this can become very cynical very easily and very um, disrespectful of the uh, concrete experience of suffering. Yet at the same time, I think we, we can see in our discussion today, and I, I agree, you know, all paper suffering came up as a sort of central topic, um, there seems to be missing a metaphysical, ontological, and theological account of suffering. We tend to think about suffering very often, and I think this is all of us <coughs> the late moderns because we are part of this condition, part of this world. Um, suffering is the dysfunctional. You know, and then it's well, defined in a sort of negative manner. It doesn't function and we just need to uh, do something about it. You know, take a drug, um, have some kind of recipe to overcome it. And I, I just wonder if we don't need um, a, a much deeper ontological or metaphysical account of suffering, of suffering and um, a deeper theological account as well. Um, I, I do think that if, when we talk about suffering, we, 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 we talk about something that's fundamentally human, it's an experience of negativity, um, which means, um, certain way, you know, a computer cannot suffer. You know, there's, and then artificial intelligence can't suffer. Something can, be, can go wrong, can become dysfunctional. But suffering has to do with this sort of deep experience of negativity. And our tendency today is, and this is where it's difficult to say, well, where do we draw the line? Because we all would agree, uh, you know, if you have a heart condition uh, and there's appropriate medicine, to help you, well, we should take it. I mean, we shouldn't fatalistically say, oh no, we, and we shouldn't celebrate suffering. Um, we shouldn't seek suffering, but it happens. And where's the line between the way how we treat suffering, how we tr try to avoid suffering by living a healthy lifestyle yeah. and by the sort of transhumanist um, vision? And um, I, I find this very, very difficult to, to really, I have an intuition that there is such a line but it's very difficult to say this is where the line is and this is why the line is here and not there. I would guess that it mainly has to do with, you know, if we lose basically a common feature of our humanity, I mean, suffering has to do with our finitude, with our, the very nature of you know, ourselves not being God. Um, if we lose this, a new species will develop that doesn't suffer anymore. That's very different from you know, taking a drug or 
you know, if you have a headache or if you have a heart condition. Uh, <coughs> I'd want to take it further than that, though. Um, <coughs> and it's interesting that we focus the discussion on the question of suffering, which is, after all, something we can do something about, as it were. <coughs> um, you brought up the question of finitude. Really, the, the limit case is a question of death. Mm. Yeah? And it's really death, not mm. suffering. It's mm. death that marks us out as human. Yeah? Mm. Because we can actually live into our death in a way that other, others cannot. Mm. Yeah? And it's perhaps, not it's, it's perhaps not striking that the questions of post-humanism, transhumanism, and so on have emerged in a world in which we radically relate, it, we, we relate to our death in radically different ways than any previous generation. Yeah? Um, you know, the, the, the life expectancy uh, that we could have had at, throughout history until the beginning of the 20th century is such that you would have seen your parents die before you reach adulthood, at least one of them, your tr several of your siblings die and so on. Today, we're likely to be in our 70s or older and our parents are still alive. We relate to death in just radically different ways than any generation of humanity before. And that is actually probably one of the biggest changes. We don't see death in these ways as we would have done before. Uh, thank you. Uh, a question in the first instance to Professor Waters, but one which may well spark wider conversation. Um, if, if I understood you correctly, um, you made a very strong case that technology can be a helpful tool at times, though uh, is insufficient on its own to promote human flourishing and can be, have quite negative consequences at other times. Um, my question is really, you know, I think one temptation here is when we think of technology to jump to the electronic gadget um, as the kind of paradigm of technology. Um, my question is, how does this work if we take a far more expansive understanding of technology and tool use as a whole? Um, I'm very sympathetic to Andy Clark's argument in Natural Law and Cyborgs that we are fundamentally tool using technological creatures and have been very much shaped by um, those kind of interactions where, you know, uh, Professor Ward spoke about how plastic we are in engaging and using and co-opting our environment um, and tools for our various purposes. Um, so question here about where do you draw the boundary of the human person um, and how do you define technology within that? Could things like religion also count as, among other things, technologies um, which transform us as well? Okay, I, I, I quoted a Canadian philosopher by George Grant. He used to quote a Spanish proverb in talking with these students ad nauseum, where whenever you're thinking about technology, he, he quoted this proverb. He said, take what you want, said God. Take it and pay for it. And I think that that's really what I want to talk about, is saying, okay, no matter what technological advance you might make, and it may very well be an advance, it's not going to be free. So what are you going to give up? And over time, what will be the, the, the cost that you can't even anticipate? So I'm a great believer in unintended consequences. We don't know in advance what will be, what we think are short-term advances may actually be, take us down a road we don't want to go. Now that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but go in with your eyes open that this isn't going to be free. So that, yeah, I mean, mobile phones are good things, but there's been a consequence to them. Uh, I, you know, Right now, I, when I, I mean, when I first, when I was young, I didn't feel all that bad driving around without a phone in the car. Now I feel panic stricken. You know, so, and I think increasingly, there's a lot of things we can't do for mm -hmm. ourselves that previous generations thought nothing of doing for themselves. And I think that that's what it, what it really is, is saying is I don't know in advance what these technological advances are, or what I'm what I'm giving up to embrace them, but I know I'm probably giving up something. Mm -hmm. And it may also be a generational thing, and, and also when I'm getting older, I'm beginning to realize what was important 40 years ago is, not no, is no longer important. And most of the things that I value have very little to do with technology. So that's just, that's just part of the, the, the equation. Uh, so yeah, I mean, again, I, I, I really don't want to seem as if I'm anti-technology. But I see, particularly as a Southern California boy, that's where I grew up, where 
what technology has been used primarily to do is simply to create late modern nomads who are attached to nowhere and going nowhere. And I'm not sure humans flourish in those kinds of environments for very long. So is this, is this a cautionary note? If that makes sense. I had a question for Father John. His part, first part of the discussion, intervention earlier. Um, it's true that we can uh, transfigure or make the suffering become active when it's, we are involved. It's about ourselves. But how about when you see suffering around you and you cannot do anything about this? Because each time when I give a lecture, uh, somehow this, the discussion re reaches, uh, touches that on that point. Everyone asks me, look at the children in Africa. Uh, you, you, it's nice to uh, issue theories and everything, but how, what can we do about that? And um, it's true that also Gregory of Nyssa said that you can tra transfigure a lot of negativity. You can do something good, but in concrete terms, how do you as a Christian deal with that? Thanks. <clears throat> um, you have to make a fundamental distinction between what you're able to understand and how you might communicate it to others. Yeah? So you don't have to even think about all the absolutely just devastating um, amounts of suffering, pain, hunger, chronic sickness, war, mutilation that there are in the world. It's horrific, absolutely horrific. Yeah? But um, as you know, Stalin would say, one death is a tragedy, 50,000 deaths is a statistic. Much more significant, not more significant, but much more challenging, in fact, is being with somebody face to face who's suffering. And in that case, it is not a matter of saying, transform it, turn it from active, obviously it's not. But that having, having the kind of things we were talking about in our mind shows us ways in which maybe we can help other people to understand what might be going on in their life. And in the meantime, we should be doing absolutely everything we can to alleviate suffering wherever it might be. I totally yeah. agree with Vent, with as he said earlier. There's no inherent value in suffering, mm -hmm. absolutely not. We should do everything we can to alleviate it. And in doing that, we are also taking up the cross ourselves, yeah? Anyway, the, the person quotes very often. Mm. Mm -hmm. Just deal with that. Mm. Yeah. Um, mm. Okay. Um, so we, we've talked a lot about suffering, which, which seemed to be um, quite a common uh, thread throughout all your talks. Another one which seemed to be, or I see kind of fomenting to the top, is um, the issue of plasticity um, and incompletion as an important component of how we understand what the human being is. Well, this is Professor Ward talking about hybridity being the kind of absolute kind of center of it. Um, Catherine Tanner's work uh, on Christ the Key and others talks a lot about, about how um, plasticity is needed in order to be formed and shaped precisely in the image of God. So it's precisely that devel developmental incompletion which then gets worked over so that we become adopted sons and daughters. And yet we also have kind of, it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Father John, that this idea of there's a vulnerability precisely in that plasticity which can actually lead to a vulnerability in our sinning, right? It's our dependency would actually kind of, um, I don't want to say primes, but, but it certainly can lead in those directions. So there is a glorious kind of way that this plasticity can be used, but it also, um, left to our own devices, can essentially go our own way and um, can lead to something like we might call fallenness. How, how do you see that kernel being, you know, a, a, a major marker, I guess, of, of the human condition? Um, <clears throat> it's interesting you brought up Catherine Tanner, questions of plasticity, um, vulnerability. The other thing, along with th those two things, which is absolutely essential, is temporality. 
Yeah? Mm. Irenaeus points out that only creatures which are subject to time are able to grow and become something other than what they were at the beginning. So temporality is also a fundamental feature of that. I'm not sure if machines are temporal <coughs> or not. They're in time, but they're, they're, but they're not, they're not yeah. temporal in, in, yeah. a, in a fundamental yeah. sense. Yeah. Subject to growth in that way, yeah? And, and growth yeah. and therefore transformation. Um, Updates. <laughs> well, <laughs> usually, usually with bugs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Okay>. um, <laughs> the, the thing I get from reading these early writers so vividly, um, and some modern writers have taken it up more recently, is, yes, you know, the, the, the question of growth through temporality, through um, experiencing, through all the different things, leads in all these different ways. Yeah, it can lead to glory, it can lead to sin, it can lead to apostasy, it can lead to all these different ways. Um, but in some ways, they're all brought together for everybody because whatever you do, it culminates in death. Just as a matter of fact, it culminates in death. Whichever way you go, however, however morally a righteous life you live on this earth, you're still going to die. Yeah? If you live in sin and apostasy, you're still going to die. <coughs> you end up in the same place. Death is the great leveler in that. Yeah? We all, it, it, all, all the Christian material for funeral services and all that talk about how king and, and poor, pauper end up in exactly the same space. It is that which, in a sense, reduces us to our lowest common denominator, yeah? that what, what actually holds us together in all of that. Yet at the same time, it's in that way that Christ has shown us what it is to be God and what it is to be human. Yeah, so it's, something really interesting is going on in that. Yeah, so we, we end up as clay. The question, of course, is: Are you going to end up being malleable clay or hardened clay? So the other ways one can then play it out. Yeah, so we're being molded and becoming malleable clay through all our life, depending on how we we deal with the givenness of our situation, our suffering, and whatever else it might be. You can resist it and get hardened the whole time, all the way through. Or you can end up by allowing your stony heart to be broken and end up with a heart of flesh. Yeah, but either way, you still haven't end up as clay. Which I, I find a uh, really comforting thought. <laughs> I just wonder if when we talk about plasticity, we do not also need at the same time the concept of, of limit or border um, as something that makes the human enterprise human. So the recognition of the sort of limits or borders. Um, and, and there are different kinds of borders. You could say human nature properly understood is the sort of border as well, because the, the transhumanist vision seems to, and, and, this, and this is where transhumanism shares a lot of ideas with a certain kind of existentialism or certain overemphasis on freedom, as if we are just spiritual beings with no nature, no yeah. body, you know, as, a, as if we are it's not, yeah, it's a certain kind of modern Gnosticism here that's, mm. a, that's at work. So you know, we can just freely decide whatever we, we, we want to do. And I, I think one fundamental limit is the, the limit of nature. Um, uh, Jens introduced the, the, this very nice distinction that Robert Spearman proposes, that you know, animals are their nature. And that's why, you know, for a sheep 3,000 years ago to be happy is more or less the same for a sheep nowadays. <laughs> Or whether it's a British sheep or um, a continental European sheep or Australian or Canadian sheep, you know, for all of them, you know, if they met and talked about happiness as a sheep, you know, they would come to very similar conclusions. But if we talk about human beings, because we are not simply our nature, we have our nature, we have to relate to our nature. Freedom is not against nature. It, freedom means it's an appropriation of nature. Um, you know, we, 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 there are different ways of living a human life. And yet, the, the, the possibilities is not, are not infinite. You know, it's not that um, there is, as far as plasticity is concerned, and the, um, the different ways of human life, as, as, as if there are no, no limits at all. And I think this, this may be an important concept as well in this sort of critique of transhumanism or posthumanism, that there's a fundamental denial of these basic limits. Mm -hmm. And nature is one, and you could say, the other human being poses another kind of limit as well, mm -hmm. you know, the sense of responsibility. You know, for transhumanism, the other human being is just a, a different example of a, you know, this post-humanist kind. But it's not um, really um, another human being in sense of a radical alter authority. 
I'm, I'm curious about the, 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 the metaphors that we're using with mm. plasticity. Uh, and in particular, in relation to John Baer's conversation that uh, being essentially begins at the point of death, um, in which we are conformed into uh, the likeness of Christ in that process that begins in death. Ductility would be a better term uh, this side of the grave. Uh, so I'm invoking my former life of, in the sciences. Uh, ductility uh, is uh, a material property in which a material is deformed like, pla like Plato is ductile. Um, the opposite would be flexible, I suppose. Uh, and, and those external forces or stresses that are applied to Plato permanently deform it or uh, temporarily deform it until another stress is applied. But this side of the grave, it seems that we are ductile, caught between being and nothingness. Uh, and to use a language of plasticity, it should only begin if, if uh, John's theology is correct. It should be, it should be used in a particular place, uh, and a different analogy should be used, uh, this side of the grave. I don't know, just speculating and trying to invoke some material physics. Why not? No, I'd, have to think, I'd have to think about that one. Thank you, thank you for introducing me to the word ductility as a way of, <laughs> of doing that, which also presumes got the idea of being led out or, or being led in something like yeah. that. Um, pl plasticity presumably ultimately derives from the word plasso, to make, to form, to mould. Mm -hmm. yeah? And going back to Irenaeus again, uh, the word he constantly uses... The, the, in fact, this might actually go more interesting also for the AI part. The word he constantly uses for the human be being is that the human being is the plasma yeah. of God, yeah. which literally means yeah. a handiwork. Yeah. Yeah? Mm. And I don't, there's no reason why it shouldn't be used for us now, knowing that it will only be fully realized when we finally become clay and malleable in his hands, but it's still being used for us now. We're in the hands of God in this whole process towards all of that. But it's really interesting. In Against the Heresies, his, his major work, he uses the word plasma in book three, four, and five to refer to the human being. But in book one and book two, whenever he uses the word plasma, it's referring to the Gnostic mythologies, mm -hmm. yeah, the fictions that they've derived with. Yeah? And ultimately, it's the same word with uh, the same meaning. But the question ultimately is, who is the poet? If we are the poet, we end up making our own plasma, which is what the Gnostics do, which is what AI people do. Yeah? You know, the fantasies you're talking about, you end up with all these fantasies, yeah. and they reflect the poet. If, on the other hand, we allow God to be the, the poet, we are the plasma. Yeah? So if we allow ourselves, if we, if we um, have an understanding which we can see the whole of creation, our life, and our place within it, within that kind of economy I tried to sketch out very briefly, you know, leading from Adam to Christ and all those kind of things, we are actually the plasma, and he's a poet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I, and John, I still think um, this is even intensified by some of the, what I would call the teenage spirit of modernity, right? I mean, on my terms. Yes. It's got to be on <laughs> my terms. My terms. <laughs> And that's sort yeah. of, you know, instead of saying, no, there's something greater that I cannot manufacture. But, but somebody else is But, the, but the whole problematic is, is going from the uh, passivity, between that passivity and activity. Yeah. You know, even as a Christian, having said, I'm no longer going to live for myself, I'm going to move from Adam to Christ, I'm going to die to myself, the sacrament of baptism, it's still me who's doing it. Yeah. yeah? And I'm, as I put it earlier, I'm caught in the first person singular. There's no way I can escape the first person singular until I'm finally dead. Mm -hmm. Then I stop working, God can finally work. Of course, I was remembering that you really are only a first person singular by in light of another. Yeah, so, there's a, so obviously there's much, much more one can say yeah. about the kind of things yeah. you've been saying, mm -hmm. which are yeah. really enriching with regard to all of that. Yeah, the question is if it's been nominative or accusative. There yeah. we go. Oh, it's it's yeah. evocative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've, we've come to the end of our time. It just. Uh, Leaves it to me to um, invite you to thank our wonderful speakers and panels today.
Thank you all for coming, and um, I guess if you want to learn more about uh, the different projects, please visit christianflourishing.com. Thank you to the Center for Theology and Modern European Thought, and also to um, McDonald's Center for uh, Christian Ethics as well. Thank you. Bye.